I thought I knew how bad of a person Sean Combs was, but the more I did my research, I realized I only knew the tip of the iceberg. Prosecutors say that the charges stem from years of sexual abuse and threats against women. In fact, the deeper I got into my research, you were 13, what were you I saying? I went there to see the lifestyle, and I saw it. I actually started to feel the fear his victims must have felt. Because he did a lot of crazy sh to people around us. One day that I know for a fact he'll be behind bars. Things got way darker than I ever imagined. I'm a savage, whatever I want to you get. And what I've come to realize is Diddy's life is one of the most evident displays of pure evil I've ever laid my eyes on. But I didn't want to make a journalistic overview of his life and crimes, those exist already. I wanted to specifically focus on his dark psychology, a deep dive into his mind, a study of evil. There are no misconceptions about me. This is the dark psychology of Diddy. I want to make something clear from the start. Usually in cases like this, I wouldn't use unsettled lawsuits as evidence for dark psychology as the things are only alleged. But Diddy lost that privilege when lying about what he did to Cassie. Cassandra Ventura, or Cassie, was a female artist that Diddy would sign to his record label, Bad Boys Entertainment. She was 19 at the time. Diddy would help produce her first album and not long after he would begin dating her. They were together for 11 years before splitting in 2018. Not much was known about their relationship, but in 2023, Cassie would seemingly out of nowhere file a lawsuit against Diddy. The lawsuit alleged that he subjected her to a decade of abuse, violence and sex trafficking. Diddy would actually settle the lawsuit straight away for $30 million, allowing it not to go to court. However, what would then happen is other lawsuits started to come out from other victims over the next few weeks, as though Cassie's bravery inspired them to come forward. They included more claims of assault, abuse and more heinous crimes we'll get into later. However, Diddy would take to Instagram to deny all of these allegations, saying they're just looking for a quick payday. He doesn't specifically address Cassie, but it's implied in this message that her allegations are also attempts to quote, assassinate his character and destroy his reputation and legacy. There would be no proof of these allegations for a few months, but in May 2024, footage would be released that changed everything. The disturbing new video appears to support some of the accusations of abuse against music mogul Sean Diddy Combs. I of course won't show the graphic part of the footage, but it clearly shows Cassie trying to leave the hotel they were in before Diddy emerges in nothing but a towel. He catches up to her, pulls her to the floor by her head before stomping on her and kicking her on the ground while she curls up and just takes the abuse. The day following this footage's release, Diddy would try and backpedal and issue a half-hearted apology for his actions. My behavior on that video is inexcusable. I take full responsibility for my actions in that video. I was disgusted then when I did it, I'm disgusted now. After this, I just knew Diddy was a liar, a master manipulator. And although not all of the other lawsuits have yet provided proof of the allegations, it's hard to discredit them. When the same accusations he said were just looking for a payday turned out to be real. As mentioned with Cassie, Diddy used the ability to bolster her career as a way into her life. He was a multi-millionaire that was working with a lot of big talent, so he used his power and clout to his advantage. When first signing her, he was 37 and she was 19, and in the space of two years, he was able to seduce her into a relationship with him, but one with dark intentions. Based on the actions that would follow, I believe that this would be dark psychological seduction. This is using calculated hidden methods to obtain the availability of a target. However, it's only dark if this situation doesn't also benefit the other person. Seducing someone isn't the bad part if you mean good, but Diddy's intentions with Cassie were far from good. Also, as you can see in the methods, a planned out process is the method where your process of dark seduction is repeated with different victims. In 2024, Model Crystal McKinney would file a lawsuit detailing how Diddy made promises to advance her career in the fashion industry. To have this big business mogul with a lot of connections in the industry be focused on you and giving you compliments, it can be very easy to believe the words are true. Diddy would then invite her to his studio, where he would provide Crystal laced weed, unbeknownst to her at the time. She insisted that she'd had enough, but Diddy would continue to pressure her to smoke more and drink alcohol until the point she was very intoxicated and felt like she was floating. He would then lead her into a bathroom where he would sexually assault her, leaving her humiliated and traumatized. Not only did he not help her progress in her career, but he allegedly blackballed her in the industry and her career went downhill. Her whole life ruined because Diddy decided she would be his next victim for dark seduction on that day. Very soon after this lawsuit, April Lampos would also file one and a theme starts emerging. April was a fashion student who met Diddy and shared her dreams of working in the fashion industry, which was met with Diddy offering to be her mentor and get her connections to the industry. In her own lawsuit, it states that Diddy love bombed her. Love bombing is a tactic that falls under the area of covert emotional manipulation, which is essentially using someone's own emotional desires to then influence them for your own benefit. Love bombing is defined as intense, sudden or forceful displays of positive feelings towards the victim to create a feeling of affection and trust initially. 
so that they have the ability to manipulate without suspicion. Diddy would shower her with gifts and flowers, even Valentine's Day cards. However, one night they went out and despite her not drinking alcohol, Diddy aggressively encouraged her to. They went to a hotel and April would state to Diddy that she feels uneasy and sick. He disregarded this and proceeded to rape her. He would then love bomb her again and promise to make things better by helping her get into the industry. And being quote, a naive college student, she gave him a second chance. However, once he'd been respectful enough to gain her trust again, he raped her in the parking lot. Believe it or not, he was able to sexually assault her on two more separate occasions after this because he promised to use his power and influence to blackball her from the industry if she didn't do what he asked. So this brings it back to Cassie. He signed her into a 10 album contract deal. For reference, the bigger female artists like Rihanna and Beyonce still don't have 10 albums, but this would pretty much lock her into his business for her whole career. But he had likely seduced her into this and promised that he would give her the world. And he did. A world of torture. At some point in the relationship, Diddy would begin to host these freak off parties. I'm not going to cover the entire details of what it consists of, but it would involve him hiring male sex workers to have sex with Cassie in front of him, whilst he watches and pleasures himself, all of course against Cassie's wishes and causing her discomfort. However, he would give her so much drugs that she was able to dissociate from these events and just let it happen. He had seduced this young woman so that he could watch this happen to her. For Diddy, it was all about the power. He was able to dictate every part of these freak offs. He picked things like what lingerie Cassie could wear, to ensuring her nails were white so they could contrast with the skin of the black men hired to have sex with her. This was truly disturbing to read. You have to realise, Diddy had to have made Cassie so fearful of him and his power that she didn't leave or tell anyone about this. He would have had to make her feel so small and so worthless that she accepts her fate as being used as an object in a sadistic fantasy, despite hating it. She also talks about the countless times he would assault her, verbally, yes, but also physically, as seen by the hotel footage multiple times a year. Remember, Diddy had a lot of influence in the music industry and so much money that he would be assumed to have connections higher up, which may have been why she felt so hopeless. We already saw with the other woman that Diddy had the power to blackball them from the industry and for Cassie, it would have been the same if she objected. He would use these mind control tactics to make the girls remain under his predatory control. Mind control was influencing someone to do something without them realizing that they were influenced. The person doing the mind control will become puppet masters, pulling the strings of their victims' minds and Diddy was doing exactly that. I mean, look at the methods. Finding those in need. Diddy was targeting young women who had just got into the industry and knew that they would seriously benefit from his connections. Restricting choice. He would make them feel like their only choices are to stay with him and fulfill his desires or leave him and be blackballed from their industry. I'd even suggest he used mind games, which is playing with a victim's psychology negatively just for fun or to gain some influence and making them think their own brain is bad when in reality, their mind is being tricked. A big mind game tactic is ultimatums, and as mentioned in Cassie's lawsuit, her volatile and abusive partner, who also owned her label and therefore held her future success in his hands, had fully exerted control over every aspect of her life. The ultimatum was that if she wanted a career, she had to do as he said, and do as he wanted. It becomes alarming then when you look at the cases of Usher and Justin Bieber. When Usher was just a teenager, he was invited to live with Diddy, where he experienced some weird things. We're sending you New over York to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. To learn <laughs> some. Flavor Camp. Yeah, Flavor that's camp. what it was called. Puffy's place was like just filled with chicks and orging like nonstop. Yeah, but you were 13. What were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it, and it was, and it was. <laughs> but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. Back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the over the frosted flakes. You know what I'm saying? Before pause was invented. What, what the, the fuck did Puff just say? Nobody's gonna acknowledge this with me. Puff just said we used to wrestle over the frosted flakes. Now, I don't like making up assumptions about what may have happened, but it seemed to be an extremely weird relationship between the young singer and the grown diddler. When Usher was 16, Diddy would produce his album and stay in contact with him into his adult years helping his career. Until Usher comes out and explicitly says anything, we won't know if Diddy did anything to him. But using these mind control and mind game tactics, something could have been done that kept Usher obedient in order to not have his career ruined by Diddy's influence. Something similar would then happen with Justin Bieber as a teenager. He's having 48 hours with Diddy. Where we hanging out and what we doing, we, we can't really disclose, but um, it's definitely a 15 year old's dream. After Justin spent 48 hours with Diddy, where he would be gifted a Lamborghini, the two of them would go a year with little contact before they met up again and Diddy questioned Justin on this lack of contact. Starting to act different, huh? No, you, ain't, you ain't been calling me and hanging out the way we used to hang out. Well, I mean, you haven't, I mean, you try to get in contact with me, you know, through all my, you know, business, you know, partners and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But 
you never really got my number, so. Right, okay. Number? You can see the nervousness and apparent fear in the 16 year old, and that could be quite telling. With the dark psychology tactics we've covered so far, it wouldn't have been hard for Diddy to have done something to Justin, but use his methods to keep him obedient. In 2024, music producer Rodney Jones, aka Lil Rod, would file a massive lawsuit against Diddy. Amongst other things, in this lawsuit, he would claim that Diddy pressured him to procure and engage in sexual acts with female workers, but also claims that he is a victim of unsolicited groping and sexual touching by Diddy, and that Diddy tried to pass him off to other male friends using more dark psychology tactics. The one I believed he was using was an attempt at brainwashing, defined as the slow process that changes a person's identity and beliefs that were intended to suit the person doing the brainwashing. Lil Rod was a straight man, however Diddy, for his own disturbed reasons, wanted to make him homosexual so that he can do the previously mentioned acts. Diddy knew that Lil Rod looked up to famous music producer Stevie J. Stevie J is married to a woman, however Diddy would show Lil Rod a video of Stevie J having intercourse with a man, before telling Lil Rod this is normal practice in the industry. He also allegedly admitted to engaging in homosexual acts himself with rapper Meek Mill and the aforementioned R&B singer. Usher, which would make that case scary if true. Diddy believed that he could use the method of identifying Rod as susceptible, using the fact that he idolises Stevie J to get him to fall into this new mindset that Diddy wants him to. Diddy would later try to pass off Lil Rod to his friend Cuba Gooding Jr whilst on a yacht, who would end up touching, groping and fondling Rod's legs, thighs, buttocks and shoulders before Rod had to push him away. When this brainwashing attempt failed, Diddy went back to the manipulation tactics and mind games, such as promising Lil Rod large amounts of money, a Grammy, and access to major record label executives. But then he would switch from promising the world to making threats, such as eating his face and killing his mother. All of this to maintain dominion and control over Rod. Diddy would even brandish his guns and brag about getting away with shooting people, apparently admitting to a shooting in 1999. And this bragging instilled a fear into Lil Rod. This installation of fear from Diddy is what introduces us to the dark psychology concept of the dark tetrad. This consists of four personality traits that when combined, create a recipe for pure evil, and I believe that Diddy shows clear signs of having all four. The first one that links to what he did with Lil Rod is Machiavellianism. One part of the definition states the ruthless exercise of power and cruelty over compassion and mercy, and in saying how they behave, it states that they try to be loved and feared at the same time so they can receive both obedience and praise, and if this is not a possibility, then they would rather be feared than loved. Diddy brandishing guns and bragging about shootings to instill fear into Lil Rod was a Machiavellian method to keep him compliant and obedient whilst these horrid acts in the lawsuit were being carried out. When Diddy was in his earlier years in the industry, he surrounded himself with violence and was allegedly involved in shootings himself that he was able to get away with. He had ties to the murders of Biggie and Tupac as well as being linked to the shootings of Suge Knight's friend Big Jake in 1995 and another shooting of a woman in 1999 but he wasn't in prison for any crimes. However, there were other violent acts that he definitely was confirmed to be the perpetrator of. In 1999, Diddy and Nas had filmed a music video for a song. When the video was practically ready to be uploaded, he changed his mind last minute and said he doesn't like the concept of the video and wanted a part of it cut. However, Nas's manager, Steven Stout, was reluctant to pull out as he had already put $14,000 into that scene a scene where the concept was Diddy's idea in the first place. The uncut music video aired on national television April 15th, 1999, and it was only a matter of minutes before Diddy and his bodyguards allegedly assaulted Steve in his office. It's said that Steve was assaulted with a phone, an office chair, and a champagne bowl. Diddy was almost instantly arrested, criminally charged, and faced up to seven years in prison, until Steve had a change of heart and asked the DA to drop charges once Diddy apologised. This would be one of the only times Diddy would apologise for his actions, but it helped him dodge another bullet and get away with it. In 2001, a talk show host, Roger Mills, would file a lawsuit that accused Diddy and his entourage of assault, false imprisonment, destruction of property, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and a civil conspiracy for events that also entailed in 1999. According to Mills, he was interviewing Diddy and asked him a question regarding the death of his former artist Biggie, who had been shot and killed. Diddy refused to answer the question and demanded that the interview end right there and for it to never be aired, even offering to buy that tape off Mr. Mills through someone else. But when Roger refused, he was attacked in a parking lot on the way back to his car. He says Diddy's bodyguards prevented him from leaving, then took the videotapes and broke his camera. Police in the area admitted there was an incident but couldn't identify the perpetrators. In court, the jury voted in favour of Diddy and he once more got away with it. These acts of violence are removed by Diddy to keep his name feared and respected. Not only can he do the crimes, but often due to his power, money and connections, he can get away with them. Diddy had a whole bunch of staff around him who aided him in his dirty work. In Lil Rod's lawsuit, he claims that when complaining to Diddy's female head of staff about his actions, she replied that this is his way of showing that he likes you. The power to get them to comply comes from the fear and love a Machiavellian is able to receive.
Next in the tetrad is psychopathy, a common term you may have heard that's hard to define but tied to superficial charm, impulsivity and a lack of empathy and remorse. If we took a look at their behaviour and compare it to Diddy's, you'll find a lot of similarities. His superficial charm in the way he has an apparent interest in upcoming talent when he really just wants to exploit them for his own twisted needs. The calculated lying, the lack of guilt towards his victims, especially towards Cassie who he was willing to deny the allegations of until the footage came out. Even in his apology video, you see an evident lack of empathy. His violent outburst towards others in the industry also showed his lack of impulsivity. The next part of the tetrad is narcissism. This is described as having an inflated self-worth and one believing they are superior. And this was Diddy to a T. At every dark moment in his life, his ability to get away with things due to his successful financial position caused him to feel invincible and that's why he was able to hurt so many people. For example, one of Diddy's earliest controversies was when he organised a celebrity basketball game in 1991. Due to his poor planning and disregard of his responsibilities, 5,000 people turned up to a college gymnasium that could only host 2,700. As a result of this and the door being barricaded shut, people got trampled on and 9 of them lost their lives. Diddy was not 100% accountable but still had a big part to play as this was his event. He gave a half-hearted apology and paid around $600,000 combined to the families of the deceased, but he had millions so he faced no real punishment. From here I believe he realised money and power were going to give him a superior ability to commit the crimes and get away with them, as documented in this video. He believed in his own power and that he deserved everything which is why he would become abusive if anyone threatened to leave him. The final part of the tetrad is sadism. Simply defined as the deriving of pleasure from the suffering of others, Diddy's freak-offs were a clear example of finding some sort of pleasure in Cassie's suffering. Voyeurism is a real thing and is defined as the practice of gaining sexual pleasure from watching others when they are naked or engaging in sexual activity. However, due to his continuous verbal and physical assault of Cassie, this was more than that. He knew she didn't want it. She explicitly told him, but he didn't care. He still filmed it, and pleasured himself to it. It excited him to see her in discomfort, filled with drugs. Fulfilling the Dark Tetrad makes it clear that Diddy is pure evil. Following his recent arrest, many more truths will come to light, but regardless of the punishment, the damage to many of the victims will never be undone. Diddy's rise to power wasn't built on music alone, it was built on fear, control and manipulation. And as the truth continues to unravel, we must ask ourselves, how many others have yet to come forward? How many victims does Diddy have? How many people have fallen into his acts of pure evil?